Now the purpose of this study is to help us make the proper migration from being ascending, standing Christians to abiding, dwelling believers. Why is this so important? Because God is not like some ATM machine where when we have a need, we go stick in our car and, and then bring out something or, you know, once in a while, he's like a doctor. We go see him when we are sick. If we are not sick, we don't pay, uh, pay any attention to him. Uh, or when we are troubled, he comes to bail us out. That's, that's not, not what God wants. God wants us to know that he's our loving heavenly father. That's why Jesus changed the whole concept. See, we need to know, I was talking to Pastor Life on the other day, I said, the Jesus that uh, came into this world, he came, he it was so radical in everything that he did. Now, I want you to realize that when Jesus came, this is 2,000 years ago, he came into a Jewish world with a whole Jewish mindset. Now, you know how important it is uh, to deal with people's mindset. If that is their mindset, then it is very difficult to deal uh, with them, especially if it is a set kind of a mindset that refuses any form of argument. Some people you meet, I mean, they will argue you like crazy because this is what they believe in and they will fight you, you know, tooth and nail kind of thing. So when Jesus came into our world, you need to understand why they wanted to kill him. Like I said in the last lesson, they wanted a builder. Jesus was the architect. Uh, they were humming a song and they wanted Jesus to put words to their song. But Jesus is a whole, uh, you know, orchestra director. He's not, he, he, he writes his own songs. And so it didn't fit into their image kind of thing. And uh, everything that he did was so different. I mean, he came in. And the way he spoke, which is what made him the son of God, which we can clearly tell that he, he knew who he was. He spoke with complete authority. And when I say authority, I mean he had authority over everything. When he said it was as if it was already done. You know, when he said to the, the first miracle itself, he says, do you have water? Go fill up the water jars, take the water, draw it out and give it to. I mean, he spoke with such authority. Uh, to prove that he was here to stay. What do you have? Well, we have two fish and five loaves of bread. Bring it here. Blessed it. Gave it Gave it to the people. Complete authority. All right. Lord, we need to pay our taxes. Peter, go fish. There'll be a fish that will come. You will get whatever we need to pay our taxes. Peter goes catch, takes out a gold coin, enough to cover all their taxes. Uh, I mean, it's an amazing thing. And the way he thought, people said, he spoke as one having authority, not like the religious leaders, but one who had real authority. He did because he was king on earth, although he was still uh, as, as a man. He exercised complete, complete authority. But one of the things Jesus brought in was his whole new definition of who God was. Now, the Jews, of course, as you know, as I said, now, now you need to understand, this is 400 years of silence from Malachi. God had not spoken to the Jews through prophets anymore. They were now 400 years of silence before Jesus came in. And when he came in, he brought a picture of, of what God should be described as. Now, in the Old Covenant, he trusted the message to prophets. But the prophets didn't do a very good job. So, uh, he, he came in as God in the flesh to describe what the Father is all about. And the picture... He painted of God, did it sit in very well with the people. It's like, wow, now like the high priest and all that. Why do we need the high priest now? Why do we need to do all the sacrifices? That's why he went into the temple. He cast out everyone. He was saying, hey, listen, man, now, now you don't need this. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. No man comes to the Father except by me. So the picture he presented of the Father was so different. Who said this man or his father? Jesus said, oh, that God's glory may be revealed. And he healed a man. That's the glory of God. The Father is working and I am working. What are you doing, Jesus? You know, you're healing all these people, you know, feeding the multitude, all this. What I see the Father do, I do. This is the heart of the Father. And when you pray, he started off by saying, then you say what? Our Father. So the whole thing about what we are studying is to bring us into a, not an ascending, a standing kind of a relationship, but really an abiding kind of a relationship with him and dwelling in his presence as often as we can. Lord, I want to stay here. David said, you know, one thing if I desire of the Lord, that will I seek after that I may 
dwell in the house of the Lord. He didn't have a house of the Lord at that time. There was no temple. It's only Solomon who later on came and built the temple, but there was no temple. So David comes in and says that I may dwell in the house. What did he mean by the house of the Lord? He meant the very presence of God. So coming back into text, Psalm 15, verse 2, 1 and 2, Lord, who may dwell, who may abide in your tabernacle, who may dwell in your holy hill, he who walks uprightly and works righteousness, works righteousness. Now, as mentioned, you know, I think a few weeks ago, we talked about, you know, almost all of the promises of God, all of the promises of God, which he has given us uh, to us uh, for, for a full rewarding kind of a life comes with conditions. And so he says, if you want to dwell in my presence, this is what I require of you. One of the things is you need to have a change not only in your walk, but you need to have something else adjusted, something else that is transformed, your own mindset in regards to work. So tonight we are doing a transformed work, transform work. Some people have the impression that work is a part of the curse, <laughs> which was brought upon, you know, with sin uh, through Adam, when Adam sinned, that God said, now you guys got to work very hard. You know, they, they imagine that if our first parents had never sinned, that we would be living such a wonderful life walking among the trees of paradise and by the rivers and having a good time, you know, laughing, joking, no work at all. And, and, they, and uh, we are all supposed to work, doomed to work because of the penalty of sin. But if you read the word, it is a far different story altogether. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. God took man, where did God create man? Outside of the garden. Then he took the man and set him down in the garden of Eden to work the ground and to keep it in order. Work the ground, keep it in order. Now, very often when it comes to church, some people feel that if they are not involved in some form of ministry in the church, whether it's uh, VVIP or whether it's ushering or, whether, you know, uh, well, whatever you are doing, worship team, Sunday school, uh, you name it, you know, going on mission trips. If I'm not doing that, then I'm not doing the work of the ministry. And uh, we place a lot of emphasis on the work of the ministry. So people would use words, hey, come and help yourself. You know, why don't you get more involved? Well, I don't feel a calling in that area. Uh, listen to me very carefully, please. If we were to ask you, somebody comes to ask you, would you help to serve in this area? Please do not say, I'm going to pray about it. Okay? Because the reason why we ask you is because we feel led by the Spirit. One of the leaders would have felt led by the Spirit to come to you and say, please help us to serve in this area. I remember at one time, you know, uh, we were just pioneering, and here is this young lady, young lady. You know, I hardly see her worshiping and all of that, but she, she was a very good pianist in our church. Not, not in our church, very good pianist. I knew that she had, at a very young age, she had got all her whatever steps that she went through. And she had graduated with all the steps and all that. So she was a very good pianist. And I said, we really need a keyboardist. Could you please come and help us? She's this young girl. And she said, well, I'll pray about it. And uh, I never called her again. I never called her again. So she missed her opportunity to serve the Lord in an area that would have caused her to rise, not just in church. I'm talking about rise in life. See, when you give something to the Lord, God always blesses you. The reason why I'm blessed is because, you know, we give ourselves to our families. Yeah, we give ourselves to the church and God blesses our home. When we decided to build the church, we said all our finances, whatever finances we have, we pour into the church. When we did that, God blesses with a beautiful home. Uh, I, I've seen the blessing of God. When you put God first in your life, listen, Jesus is not joking when he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All things will be added. Don't go seeking after things. But don't put the cart before the horse. You know, we have to really think, is, did Jesus mean what he said? And will he do what he says? Of course he will. I am God. I'm not a man that I should lie, says God. 
All right, so now we come, we're not talking about so much of the work of the ministry, we're talking about the ministry of work, that your work is important, that work was part of the unfallen life in Eden. When God first brought Adam into the garden, it was before Adam sinned. It was never meant that man should should have nothing to do, idleness, you know, it was not part of the Edenic, uh, I mean, uh, of Eden's happiness. Idleness is never has never been part of, you know, happiness. We need to understand that. Now, of course, the fall of man, the fall of man changed the character of work. L work was never a curse. It was meant to be a blessing. But man, because of his sin, changed the whole character. The nature of work became different now. So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, and to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> some of you ladies don't like that one. Last week I talked about husbands who love your wives. Some of the men didn't like that one. But today he's saying, no, because you have listened to your wife, men, please, if, if God has given you a mandate, go with the mandate. Okay. Uh, and you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you. You shall not eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your brow. How shall you eat it? By the sweat of your brow, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. That said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. <laughs> now, if God has given you something to do as the man, you know, if you feel this is what I've got to do, pray much about it, talk to the wife, and make a decision. All right, because you see, God told Abraham, Abraham, you're going to have a child. God told Sarah the same thing. But then along the way, Sarah decided she was going to help her husband. Maybe what God meant was this. And this is where the problem is. Maybe what God means is this. So when that happened, she said, why don't you take, you know, my maid? She's beautiful. She's an Egyptian. She's Hagar. Take her in and uh, sleep with her and she can give us a son because it was, you know, remember this is about what, 4,000 to 4,000 years ago, most, more than that, right at the beginning of time itself, all right? So anyway, uh, at that time, it was permissible for the man to have, to sleep with his maids. You know, they would become part of his, uh, well, concubines like Solomon had, uh, 300 wives and 700 concubines. <laughs> they say concubines. <laughs> anyway, uh, and, and Abraham listened to the voice of his wife. And he had, you know, Ishmael. And then later on, there was trouble in the house. Sarah and Hagar had fighting because of what was happening. Hagar began to think, oh, I can give birth, you cannot give birth kind of thing. Because giving birth was a sign of beauty, uh, acceptance. Oh, I, I, more, I will become more loved than you are. So, you know, contention in the house. And when that happened, Abraham went to God and said, God, what shall I do? Read your Bible, okay? And God said, go ask your wife what you shall do. Uh, you listen to your wife earlier, now you come and ask me. Go back and ask her what to do. And so, of course, uh, Sarah said, kick her, out, kick her out of the house, which was a very bad thing. So now we come into this thing. Work is, is something that God blessed us with. Now, work may infer that before the fall, uh, work was actually very pleasant. Work was well accepted. It was enjoyable. It was without burden. It was, uh, you know, no care, no pain, no sorrow, no uh, everything. All right, so work was something that was very congenial. In other words, we, we, we liked it. That was before the fall. Yet when we, we must not forget that, that that was part of God's agenda for man, that man would begin to work. All of life testifies to this. All of life testifies to this, that uh, every time you find work that is good, the conditions are good, people enjoy themselves, right? But where there is no work and where there is idleness, my father used to say, you know, the idle hands and idle mind is a devil's workshop. All kinds of things begin to come in. You got all kinds, because you're so free. So all kinds of thoughts begin to come in, right? So work uh, was meant to be like this. 
But of course, because of sin, then everything began to change. So now people think, you know, uh, retire early. Robert Kiyosaki, or I think that's his name, or Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, how to retire early, finish early so that you can have a lot of time for yourself. Well, actually, God has included six days you shall work. It doesn't say you shall stop at one time. You shall continue to work. If you enjoy your work, they say you have never worked a day in your life, which is true. I enjoy what I'm doing. Of course, a number of pastor friends that I know of have already retired, thinking of retirement. They said, you know, we should back off. Well, I don't see why. I mean, if you have a strong voice, you can still speak, uh, you know, uh, and, and you've got years of wisdom now over the years. Some pastors, you know, like my age, over, we have been in ministry for so many years. Why stop and not dispense of that wisdom to other younger pastors or other people? You, As long as you have health, I think we should enjoy every moment. So you can tell I'm not going to retire fast. Okay? <laughs> I'm going to continue for some time. So here are a few things to consider when we talk about work. Number one, work's source. Where do we get this whole idea concerning work? Of course, God is the one who did it with us. But, but if we understand that God is the source of work, God himself started with work. Look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. On the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work. God had created and made. Now, you can't miss the point. God worked, God worked, God worked. Now, work was not a curse for God. Work was never a curse for God because God is not cursed. He is not burdened. He is not frustrated. He is not coerced to do what he does not want to do. Uh, you know, it is his fullness. He, it is who he is that brings out everything. I am so glad God worked. We have this beautiful, beautiful planet called Earth. When David describes the work of God, he calls it the handiwork of God. He says the sons of God shouted for joy when God created the worlds, the universe. It says he spun the world into existence. In other words, he just stretched out his fingers, you know, which is part of his work, and the worlds came into existence. But when it came to the earth, God planted a garden. God took the dirt, formed a man. God breathed into man, and God, you know, uh, created this beautiful thing called mankind. So David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This is God. Work was the glory of God. And has he stopped working? The answer, of course, is no. In John chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus answered them and said, My Father is working until now, and I am working. He who has begun a good work in you. Who began that work? God began a work in us. And he who is faithful to complete the work that he began. Amen. So the source of uh, work, work source is God himself. Jesus sanctified labor. He sanctified it. Sanctified hard work. And why do I say that? Because he began as a carpenter or as a builder. Now, in those days when you say carpenter, it meant a builder because the, they used the wood not only to build furniture, they also built houses. Every house was made of wood. So Jesus was a builder, always building, always building. Uh, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it, when, when you realize that God always wants to build and he will not stop building until everything is complete. So when he died and he was in the tomb and he rose again, first thing he did was he folded the handkerchief that was over his face and put it down. Now, completely folded handkerchief means the work is finished, right? It is finished. So he finished the Father's will by... by food, my whole desire, what do I eat on? Uh, the will of God. My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of God and finish it. So our source of work, the whole idea of working must come. We must understand that it is God. Work is a good thing, all right? Number two, work's purpose. Work's purpose. Enjoy life with your wife. Hallelujah. <laughs> Whom you love. All the days of your futile life, which he has given you under the sun, all the days of your futility, 
For this is your portion in life and in your work, which you have labored under the sun. According to Solomon, both marriage and work are our portion. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. But he talks about work as well. This is your labor. This is your reward. The fact that God gives us the ability to do so. So uh, this means that in life, if life is worth to be, if life is to be rewarding, if it is to bring me great satisfaction, that work is a part of the equation. Part of the equation. So Solomon says in the following verse, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter nine, uh, verse ten. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Get involved with your work. Don't despise what you have. Do you know that there are many people who would love to have a job, but they don't have a job. So we are to put in everything when uh, whatever we are doing. Colossians, First uh, Corinthians chapter ten, verse thirty-one. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Colossians 3, 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God and the Father, God the Father through Him. Colossians 3, 23 and verse 24. Whatever you do, work heartily as the Lord, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. You are serving Jesus, it says, you know. And and uh, like, like I often try to say to you, I've not said that for quite some time. You possibly never heard me preach this, but I've always said this. Work in such a way where it would be impossible for your boss to sack you. Turn up early, finish late, work conscientiously, give it your best. Don't steal from your boss. All right. When I say steal, I don't mean uh, stealing, you know, finances. I mean stealing of the time, of the effort that you're meant to put in. It is required of you. You're paid a certain amount of uh, finances for your, what you are doing. Give it your best shot. So the last person to fire, in case there's a whole recession, will be you. I would be a wonderful, you know, I would be wonderfully blessed if I have somebody who would just work in spite of. Don't just do what I tell them to do, but do. Everything. I mean, they, they just go. They have the initiative. They just go and get things done. So now think think for uh, uh, about the pandemic for a while. When that shut down, do you know the kind of disaster it brought to families? Jobs were lost. Businesses were shut down. People could not work. Everybody waiting to go back to work. The roads were empty. Now you find trucks, nonstop trucks. And we, when we look at all the trucks, we say, Lord, thank you. Economy is returning back to the country again. But when there was a pandemic, the only thing I liked about it was when I drove on the road, there was nobody else, especially when the police gave me permission. Man, you drive, it's like you alone on the highway. That was nice. But it was very not nice for many families. So lives were lost. People died, not because of the disease, but suicides. Uh, family breakup, you know, because guys go out and they work all of the time and suddenly they are confined to the house. They can't go out and meet their friends. They can't socialize. Everything was affected. Okay, and so many things happened. Uh, so not only is work a reward from God, but when we labor heartily, God says you shall receive a greater inheritance. So the whole thing is, when we get before the Lord, it says, well done, the good and faithful servant. Well done. You did it. You did it. At the end of the day, well done. You have done something. Amen. Okay, let's go on now to work's focus, the focus of our work. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10 through verse 13, it says this. While we were still there with you, we gave you this command or this rule. He who does not work shall not eat. Yet we hear that some of you are living in laziness. I mean, how direct can you be? Can, can you imagine me preaching that? I hear some of you guys are lazy, refusing to work, wasting your time in gossiping. <laughs> Dear Lord, this was a spiritual church, I want you to know. They were waiting for the coming of the Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we appeal to such people. We command you, quiet down. In other words, just shut up. <laughs> Stop talking. Get to work and earn your own living. To the rest of you, I say, dear brothers, never be tired in doing the right thing. Now, these people, you know, what happened was 
to give you a background to the Thessalonian churches. They are waiting for Christ coming. And in the meantime, they began to have this whole thing, you know, if Jesus is going to come, and then, you know, whatever we do is at no point, you know, so uh, we just wait for him, we just wait for him. They all were expecting Jesus to come at that time, right, 2,000 years ago. <laughs> they expected Jesus to come, Jesus to come. Some kind of, people began to teach these things, like it is being taught now. Get ready, get ready. People, do you know that in the, the Y2K thing affected a lot of people? I helped a guy move all the way to the border of Canada from Seattle, Washington. I helped him move his, he had a U-Haul truck and I drove, uh, I mean, I was sitting with him. We drove all the way, we had to set up his house at the border of Canada. I think he had about maybe 40 acres of land. He had built his whole place, Y2K. Everybody's going to come. He built a house so that all his uh, children could come and stay with him. He had about maybe five, six guns in the house, kept guns. I mean, I'm talking about like submachine gun, handguns. He had a few guns in the house. Now, this guy, quote, unquote, was a prophet. And he really went about teaching these things. This is what's going to happen to Y2K. Get involved in gold. Uh, you know, don't, get, don't get stuck with money. Change it. People began to do this. And then you bury it all, bury it all, you know. And he had a water place on the other side, dug a well on the upper side of the hill so the water will run down. I mean, the guy was a brilliant guy, very smart. Nearly 40 over acres of land. And he was going to plant different things, waiting for the second coming of, uh, G I mean, the Y2K. Armies are going to surround and take away everything that people have. So we stay out there in the country. No work, no work, no, 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 no work. Just get prepared. Stock enough food. He had been stocking food, dry food, everything. Now, to be honest with you, I also went to Switzerland at one time, went to Switzerland, and we went into the home of this pastor. And in Switzerland, a lot of them have got bunkers. In case, he took us into his bunker. The bunker is uh, in case there's a nuclear war. Uh, wonderful Christian man took us and showed us the bunker, and they got all this dry, st dry food stuff and all that can last up to seven years. <laughs> That's right, a whole family. Beautiful bunker in the inside, all, you know, uh, totally protected against nuclear waste kind of thing, right? Radiation. So the early church had this too, and it has spread. It has never stopped spreading. So he says, listen, man, you've got to get involved. You know, today I, I've heard even people in, in the United States say, you know, go ahead and take loans, you know, to, to buy a house or whatever it is. Take big loans. Rapture happens. You don't have to pay the loan. So what you're doing is you're using your religion to try and cheat the bank. But it's not going to happen, man. <laughs> You will have to pay the loan. Jesus is not going to come in that sense. Okay, and redeem you from your, your cheating, your deceitfulness. He's not going to do that, all right? Now, please note, I want you to understand that this was a speaker to people who, didn't, who, who couldn't find jobs. This, this was speaking, Paul was speaking to people who could find jobs, but they just didn't want to work. So when people choose to intentionally be unemployed, it can lead to serious problems for both the individual, for society. For individuals, it can lead. If, if I don't work, then how am I going to pay the bills? If I get involved in things where I cannot, you know, I, I kind of just waste a lot of stuff. I'll talk about that when it comes to handling our finances. But uh, if I don't work, then I cannot enjoy the privileges of it. So, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. Anyone does not provide for his relatives... Now, when the Bible talks about relative, this is written 2,000 years ago, talks about very close relatives, my brother, my sister, those who are dependent upon me, uh, that when I don't provide for them, and especially the members of his own household, his children, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Verse 11 shows us a couple of problems that unemployment can have. It talks about these people that begin to create problems. They create trouble. They become disorderly. They do things which cause havoc. They wreak havoc. Break the laws when they are disorderly. So now we come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 10 and 12. We urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more, to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. It's a terrible thing for unbelievers to say that. Always say pray, pray, Christian and all that. I don't want to work, depend on 
wife depend on people always borrowing. It's a terrible, terrible thing. It brings shame uh, to the name of Christ. So work is health. Work is life. Uh, you know, work is the way to str- to strength, to power. Work builds up character. Work carries in itself. And, uh, you know, one one of the prime secrets of happiness is that it'll it'll carry you through because you have worked well. Idleness is never truly happy. And he who labors with all his might has a good conscience. Solomon says, the one who works well, works hard, sleeps well. All right. Because they rest, you know, they rest. And so God kind of set back. Now, when it says God rested, he didn't mean he sat down in his chair and relaxed. Now I'm going to retire, already created. No, no, no. It meant that he moved back to observe his entire creation. And he said, it is very good. I trust that you will look at your work at the end of the day and go, wow, that was very good. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. The Lord bless you. Let's just pray. Father, I pray that we would understand your word clearly declares six days you shall work. You are more focused on the ministry of work rather than the work of the ministry. Rather than the work of the ministry, you are focused upon the ministry of work. What your people do every day is so utterly important to you. And I pray that you will deliver us from any form of idleness. Even if we have retired, those who are already retired, may we find it Oh, uh, you know, find a place where we can continue to learn and better ourselves in different ways in, in helping other people, continuing the good work that you began in us, uh, flowing out of ourselves, walking in love, walking in the spirit, walking by faith. Lord, that we would continue our walk and our work observed by the Son himself. We commit ourselves to you right now. We ask for your blessing upon each one through this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.